All right, good morning. Thank you, Brian. Praise team. Wonderful music this morning. Great messages. We're going to begin this morning just reading a scripture verse in Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14. In him, which would be Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. I want to start with a question. How do you know for certain that when you die, you're going to heaven? Well, I want to tell you how I know. I have God's personal guarantee. That's what those verses are. When I heard the word of truth, and of course that is that I was a sinner and I needed a Savior, and I repented of my sin and I asked Jesus to come in my heart to save me, God gave me his Holy Spirit as his own personal guarantee that I've been saved. Now that manifests itself in two ways. First of all, it's manifest in the dramatic changes that take place. Once the Holy Spirit comes to live in you, the Holy Spirit begins working you. He's trying to make you like Jesus. That's his goal, to make you like Jesus. And as he does that, it's my guarantee. I see the changes. And I know that it's not something I'm doing. It's something God's doing. And that's the first way that I know that I'm going to heaven. Now, the second way the Holy provides a guarantee for me is the living word of God. I want you to listen very carefully to some words of Peter as he talks about God's personal guarantee, um, and it's through the word of God. This is in 2 sec, uh, Peter chapter 1, verse 19. Peter says, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. Now, I don't want you to think about this. I don't want to just read it real fast. We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The reason so much of God's word is prophetic is God wanted to prove to us that the Bible is the Word of God. 25% of the Bible, when it was written, was prophetic. 25% of the Bible was future telling of what was going to happen in, in the future. Now, much of this has already been fulfilled, as you are well aware. Last week, we talked about Jeremiah, and Jeremiah prophesied that God's people, because of the disobedience to God, they were going to be carried out into captivity, and they were being captivity for 70 years. And after that 70 years, and the reason that this has happened is because they had, they had been so disobedient for many, many centuries. Uh, they had avoided uh, obeying God about the, jubilee, the year of the Jubilee, which is just every 50 years. And so for all those missed Jubilee years, God says, I'm going to punish Israel. They're going to be carried into captivity. And for 70 years, 70 jubilee years they had missed, they were going to be in captivity. And then once that was over, they were going to be able to return to the land. Well, guess what? That's what happened. They were carried into captivity, into Babylon captivity for 70 years. And at the end of that period, they were allowed to return to their land. You get to the New Testament, Jesus predicts that the new temple, now the temple's been rebuilt, it's now very beautiful, it's, a, it's called Herod's Temple, it took many decades to, to rebuild, and uh, Jesus was pointing to the temple and he told his disciples, you know what, not one stone of this temple is going to be left upon another. The, the temple is going to be so destroyed that every stone is going to be removed from one another. And sure enough, 40 years later, the temple was destroyed, just as Jesus predicted it would be destroyed. Bigger than that, we have Ezekiel 2,500 years ago, 2,500 years ago from now, predicted that Israel later would become disobedient and they would be scattered all over the world. Not this time, not just be in captivity, but they would be scattered over all over the world. And they would remain scattered until the time came towards the end times when they would return to their land. It's called the vision of dry bones. And first he saw the bones come together. You know, they're all scattered out. And then the bones came together. And then flesh came upon the bones. And they came to life. All of that. 
And this is, this is prophesying that Israel would one day come back to her land and they would become a nation again after 20, uh, 20 centuries. And, of course, that's happened. Not in my lifetime, but I wasn't, I wasn't too, uh, too old when it happened or too, too much after I was born. Um, Ezekiel on May, uh, I mean, Israel on May the 14th, 1948, this prophecy was fulfilled. Then Peter in this verse, as we look at Peter this morning, Peter claims that the prophetic word was more con- uh, fully confirmed in his day. So you look at all these things that happened, okay? You have the Jeremiah's prophecy. You have Ezekiel's prophecy. You have, have the prophecies of Daniel. And so Peter's saying, and now all, at, he is prophesying after Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. He's saying, after all this time, we, we have more proof that the word of God is the word of God because all these prophetic prophecies have now been fulfilled. Think about that. I really want you to focus on that this morning as we, as we look at it. Last week we looked at Daniel's amazing life. And Daniel as a young man had been carried into captivity. And as you recall, we talked about how King Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, had this really as a nightmare, but this dream. And, and he, he commanded all of his wise men, I want you to tell me what my dream is. And I want you to tell me what it means. Of course, nobody's ever heard of this before. Tell us what you dreamed, then we'll tell you what it means. That's what the, 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 you know, usually was. And they said, no, we, I want you to tell me my dream. And they couldn't do it. So they were going, he was going to kill all the wise men. And Daniel got word of it. And when Daniel got word, he went to the king. He said, king, give me a little bit of time. And I promise you, God will tell me. God will tell me what your dream is. He'll tell me what it means. Sure enough, he went back and his friends prayed. And that night, God gave him uh, the dream and a vision. Told him what it meant. And he went back to King Nebuchadnezzar. Told him what the dream was all about. And what's interesting is the king's dream not only predicted the future of our past, but it actually also predicted the future of our future. I want you to think about this for a moment. The first part of Daniel's dream was about this big image that he had. And the, the head and the shoulders were made out of gold. And then uh, the stomach and so on. And, and the belly was made out of silver. And then, then you have the next portion of the thighs were made out of Bronze, and then the, the legs were made out of uh, iron, and then the feet were made out of iron and clay. And so Daniel says, that's your dream. And then you saw a, a stone come along, and the stone hit the, the statue, the image at the feet, and it fell, and then all the image just sort of went into dust, and the wind came along and blew away the whole, everything that was there. And then the stone all of a sudden became a great mountain that filled the whole earth. And he said, is this not the dream you had? And Daniel says, yes, yes, that's what I dreamed. And then Daniel told him what the dream meant. He told him that, that basically what was going to happen is he, King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, was the head of gold. But then the silver part was going to be another kingdom that was going to come and replace his kingdom. And it was not going to be as strong as going inferior to his, but it would replace his. And then another one would come along and it would be replace that and so on and so forth. And, and we know in history... After Babylon came the Persian Empire. After Persian Empire came the Greek Empire. After the Greek Empire came the Roman Empire. And that's basically about five, six hundreds of history, years of history after Daniel died. And yet he knew it and he, prophes- he told him what it was. It's biblical prophecy. But that's all history. The second part of his dream has not yet, prof- it's future for us even. The stone, of course, is Jesus the Messiah. And when he returns at the second coming, he's going to, he's going to defeat the Antichrist, this final the defeat of the, the clay and the iron. So he's going to defeat that. And then he's going to uh, become the ruler of the world. And uh, there will be no end to the kingdom of God. And so, so it's future as well. So what is, what is Peter saying? Peter is saying that all of the future prophecies of God will be fulfilled Because God has already fulfilled all of these other prophecies. That's the reason that God does this in the first place. So what does that mean to us personally? Well, it means something that we have not yet seen. It's future, the the rapture of the church. It's a prophecy of the future. I'll tell you what's going to happen. Just like these other things are fulfilled, it's going to happen. And after that future rapture, there's going to be a future tribulation. Like the world's never seen, seven years long. If it wasn't shortened, the days would be, you know, everybody would have died. And then at the end of the tribulation, there's going to be a future second coming of Christ. And he's going to establish his kingdom. And that prayer that we prayed called the Lord's Prayer for many centuries now. 
Our, you know, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. It's going to be fulfilled because Jesus is going to set up his kingdom for a thousand years. It's going to rule and reign. And so all of this is future, and yet it's going to happen because all the others happen. Do you see what Peter's trying to say here? That's what he's trying to say. He's saying that all future uh, prophecies will happen because God has already confirmed in the past with the ones that have. So with this in mind, what I want to do, and this is going to be very difficult because we've been imagining that we had the person, that we're, the story that we're talking about. We've talked about David, and we've talked about uh, uh, Daniel in the lines in the last week. I want you to imagine now that I'm Daniel, but now I'm resurrected, and it's 2022, July the 3rd, 2022. Can you do that? I know it's a little harder. All right, this is what I'm going to do. Well, as I told you last Sunday, when I was a young man, I heard the prophet Jeremiah warn us because of all our disobedience that God was going to judge us. And I remember something like this. Jeremiah said, thus says the Lord, for I am about to bring disaster out of the north and it will be great destruction. Like a lion that has come up from its lair, the one who destroys nations has set forth from his home base. He is coming out to lay your land waste. Your cities will become ruins and lie uninhabited. Well, I'm here to tell you that's exactly what happened. King, Babylon, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar came from Babylon. He destroyed our city, Jerusalem, laid it to waste, destroyed everything, destroyed the temple. And he carried all those that survived, and many didn't survive, but all those that survived, he carried back to captivity. And it wasn't long after that, I told you last Sunday or last week, that some of our friends were taken back with me. And we were put to the test right away. And then King Nebuchadnezzar had this crazy dream about this huge image. And he demanded that people, his wise men, tell him what the dream was, what it meant. And I interpreted it for him and told him what the dream was. And, and then years later, I had been again to have dreams. And I had dreams that were about the future as well. And God showed me what those things meant. And it was about in the first year of King Darius that I finally understood Jeremiah's prophecy predicting the 70 years of desolation. And so they were in the midst of that, coming to the end of that time, actually, and I really desperately wanted to know what next, what's going to happen after we get to return to our land. And I was fasting and praying for weeks, and finally God sent an angel, Gabriel, to give me the answer. And in essence, this is what he told me. He said, he says, for Israel's future, there's going to be 70 weeks have been determined. And in these 70 weeks that are determined for your people as well as for your holy city, God's going to do six things. And here's what he's going to do. First of all, he's going to finish the transgression. Second of all, he's going to make an end of sins. And third, he's going to make reconciliation for iniquity. Now, as it turns out, those three things are what the Messiah Jesus did when he came the first time. As you all know, when Jesus died on the cross, he finished the transgression. He made an end of sins. And he made reconciliation for the iniquity so that you can be saved. The next three things that Jesus is going to do is going to deal with his second coming. There's still future for you. He's going to bring in, bring in everlasting righteousness. Boy, that sounds great, doesn't it? Everlasting righteousness. He's going to seal up vision and prophecy. In other words, all prophecies and, and, and visions are going to be fulfilled, every single one. And then he's going to be anointed the most holy. He's going to be king of kings and lord of lords. Now, there are three things I need you to know and understand about these 70 weeks. Very important. First of all, these weeks do not mean seven days. They're not weeks of days, okay? They're weeks of years, actually. And the best way for me to explain this to you is when you go to the grocery store, and you buy a dozen eggs, right? You expect to get 12 eggs. One dozen is 12, right? And if you send someone to the store to get two dozen eggs, you expect to get 24 and so on and so forth, right? Well, that's what weeks is. In fact, in the context in which I was praying, and you know, it was years, and so in the context of what I was praying, Gabriel was telling me that, that Israel and all of our future is dependent upon 70 times 7 years, which is 490 years. That's what the 70 weeks mean. You've got to understand that. 
that these weeks are years. So it would be 490 years. All right, hopefully you're so with me so far. The second thing you need to know is that these years are Jewish years. Our Jewish year is 360 days. And I realize that under your year, you have 365, maybe 366 if it's a leap year. So we need to keep that in mind because it's going to prove to be very important. So 360 years is what we're talking about, 360 days in a year. The third thing you need to realize is that these 490 Jewish years have been divided up into three parts. And this is where it gets a little tricky, so really stay, stay in tune with this. The first part were seven weeks. All right, well, seven weeks, it's not really weeks. It's seven times seven years, which would be 49 years. The second part is 62 weeks. Turns out that seven times 62 is 434 years. Are you with me so far? I know it's getting a little complicated. 49 years, 40, 433, 34 years. And then there's one, you get, add those together, you get one week left. And of course, how many, this is a tough one, I know. How many, how long is that one week supposed to be? Somebody tell me, please. Did I hear it? Seven, seven years? Seven years. All right. You've got to get this. It, and once you understand these things, it's a key to understanding the prophecy. So here's what Gabriel told me. He says, now listen, from the decree that's made for you to return to your land, your people to return to the land and rebuild their Jerusalem and their temple and their walls and all of Jerusalem. Until the time that that's completed is going to take seven weeks or 49 years. Turns out on March the 5th, 445 B.C., Artaxerxes made the decree to Nehemiah to return to, you could return your people now to Jerusalem and you could rebuild the city and its temple. Guess what? It took 49 years for that to happen. It was in 396 B.C. historically when Israel's walls and temple were, it's called Zerubbabel's temple, and it was finally completed in 396 B.C., 49 years, just as the prophecy had been given to me. Now, the second part of the prophecy started when the temple was rebuilt, and it lasted until the Messiah was cut off. Now, what would that be, the Messiah being cut off? Well, the best way, I think, to understand and calculate this is just to go back and just go and begin with the decree that was made to rebuild the temple and add that to the other years, the 434 years from the time the temple was rebuilt, and you get 483 Jewish years. And when you put that together with how many 360 days are in Jewish years, and you convert that into solar years, then you're going to have an idea of what we're talking about in the calendar. So let me, okay, you're, I lost you, I'm sure. If I lost you, raise your hand. Good. I lost it. Good. So I got some little notes up here for you to help you out. Okay, so what I said was 360 Jewish days, and now we're taking the seven plus the, 64, uh, the seven years and the 62 years, and, and that's, 400, that's 483 Jewish years total. So we multiply that together, and this is the number we get, 173,880 days. I'm going to just give you a moment to look at that. If I was in math class, I always want to kind of give me a little time to think about it. If you got a calculator, you just check me out. 360 times 483 is supposed to be 173, 880. I'm, I'm trying to hear if you're getting it. Okay, I think you got that. Okay, now. Now we've got to convert it to your years. Okay, do you understand what we're doing? Jewish years just to, to your years. So we take the 173,880 days. We're going to divide it by and... Since there's a leap year every four years, let's just say every year, for technical sake, is 365.25. Do you get that part? Okay, it's a little more technical. Okay. Now, when you do that, this is what you get. Check it out. 476.06 solar years. Anybody checking me out? Trust me, I've done this five times. I know it's right. All right, so now we have... Okay, so now we've got this B.C.A.D. thing that you guys, you know, after, before Christ and after his ascension. 
Well, we got to figure this out. So what we're going to do is we're going to take 445 B.C. because that's a year that the decree was made when this whole 70 weeks thing started, this whole 490 years thing started. We're going to take 445 and we're going to subtract it from what we just got here, the 476 point, uh, 0.06 solar years. Now, when you do that, this is not really ter terribly hard math here. You get 31.06. Is everybody okay with that? So 31.06. Now, here's, the diff here's something that you've got to catch. When the calendar was made in what, the 15th century by Pope Gregory, <clears throat> going back to when Jesus was born and all and coming to the earth, a little miscalculation and all that too, but here's the thing. Now I've lost my train of thought after all these many years. Okay, so there's no zero. You don't get down to B.C. You get to 1 B.C. Now think about this. You get to 1 B.C. What was the next year after 1 B.C.? <laughs> no. Good, Amy, but that's not right. 1 A.D. There is no zero. It's 1 B.C., the very next year. So now what you have to do to make this accurate, you have to add one more year to get the right A.D. number. OK, so I'm doing this. So you add one year to 31.06, you get 32.06. I'm trying to make this so you can follow me. Now, when did this whole thing start? 445 B.C. It started on March the 5th. That's when the whole calendar thing began. So the one easy part is 32 A.D., but what's 0.06 of a year? Well, you multiply 0.06 times 365, and you come up with 22 days. So you have to add the 22 days to March the 5th, and now you come up with March the 27th, of, of 32 A.D. The point I'm trying to make is that God gave me the timeline to predict the very day when Jesus will be crucified on the cross. 500 years before it actually happened. Now, I call that amazing. Now, out of character again, obviously Daniel could not have told us this before he died because he didn't know any of it. But suppose he could. Suppose Daniel could come and speak to our church this morning and tell us and explain to us. I think he would do it something like this. I know it's technical. I know it's one of those things. A lot of people say, oh, I just can't understand that. I can't. I'm telling you, it's when you begin to realize how amazing it is that God gave Daniel the very to the very day when the, Jesus would be crucified on the cross 500 years before, that is profound. That is profound. So what I want to do is I want you to realize that the only explanation for this prophecy of Daniel and all the others for that matter and its miraculous fulfillment predicting the day Jesus would be crucified is that the Bible is fully confirmed word of God. You, this is if anything you take away today, I want you to understand that God proved to us without any shadow of a doubt, time and time again, Daniel's prophecy just is one of many, that he had to write it. Because no one could predict the things that God has predicted for them to come to pass if he hadn't. So what does it mean to me personally? What does it mean to you personally? Well, I want to tell you, I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which is committed against that day. I'm convinced of that. I've never seen heaven, but I'm fully convinced I'm going to see it. I've never seen Jesus, but I'm fully convinced I'm going to see him. 
The fact that the Bible is filled with fulfilled prophecies fully convinces me that all the future prophecies his word has promised me will also be fully fulfilled. God has given us his Holy Spirit and he makes all these amazing changes within us. But God also has given us his holy word with all these amazing prophecies to prove that he did it. And how did he do this? Peter says he did it by the moving of the Holy Spirit amongst men of God to write down these prophecies. It's like Daniel. Does it bother you that most of the promises that God has made to us personally have not yet been fulfilled? No, none of us have seen heaven. None of us have seen God. None of us have seen Jesus. But I want to tell you something. It doesn't bother me even a little bit. Why? It's because I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. You ever hear those words before? It's a great hymn. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Heavenly Father, thank you for Daniel. What an amazing, amazing Miracle. And giving him, he wanted, he was such a man of God. He was a man of prayer. He was a man of faith. All of his life served you in horrendous situations. And towards the end of his life, his, his, his whole life was in captivity primarily. And, and he's just wondering and wanting and desperately wanting to know what's the future of your people. And you sent Gabriel and you gave him this incredible prophecy. And as we've already described, how it was fulfilled and all the way up through week 69 when Jesus was crucified to the day. And now this mystery of the church has made a gap between the 69th and the 70th week. And we're still waiting for that time when the calendar will once again begin working with the Jews and Israel. And that means the church is taken out. The church will be gone and the rapture takes place and the tribulation will begin with the signing of that decree as was given to Daniel with the Antichrist leading the Jews and their enemies to sign a peace treaty that would last how long? Seven years. The last week of Daniel, the week that's called the time of Jacob's trouble. God, it's so amazing. It's what that does to our faith when we realize how You've given us this prophetic word to let us and convince us that this is your word. There's no other way that you could walk away with all this without being fully convinced it's your word. But what that does for our faith is all the promises are yet to be fulfilled. The fact that someday I want to be with you in heaven, the promise you've made me, the fact that I will be with Jesus someday, I want to see him, I want to be with him. I know they're going to happen because your word is true. And every promise one day you say, will be fulfilled. Every prophetic word when Jesus comes to rule and reign will have been fulfilled in your holy word. So thank you for that faith. Thank you for that hope. And if there's someone here today that has any doubts and any questions that today they will understand, you know what? The Bible must be the word of God. And the Bible, if it says I'm a sinner, I must be a sinner. And if the Bible says I need Jesus, I must need Jesus. And that, Father, they might become a part of the promises that you give because you say anyone who gives their heart to Jesus and is saved will go to heaven and have eternal life. That's the promise you make, and that's the promise you'll keep. And so I pray to that end as we close this service, an open invitation to anyone to come to Jesus as we sing in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together as we respond.